All right, let's get started. Um, announcements. Uh, I posted solution sets for the first three problem sets. So if you want to look at solutions, so you're confused about a point you got off or something, you can look at my solutions. They're completely worked out. Uh, nice and explicit solutions, so nice help. Um, <coughs> might may find some of the results in, in problem set three to be useful for the exam in case you need to think about enthalpy a little more. Um, what else? Uh, any questions about the exam so far? <laughs> well, I'm not going to answer that question. So, uh, so I, I, I did get a lot of questions about problem problem one in my email this week, um, and I every person who's emailed me about it has basically overthought the question. The question yeah, is, the same. You just it. Like, that's why yeah, the, the 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 idea is is that you should it, you should find that for the idea is is that in benzene. I'll just kind of give you a gist of the benzene part. Um, the idea is that you should, you can naively think of benzene as a cyclohexene, but with three double bonds, right? So if, enough, if all else being equal, you would expect that the enthalpy of hydrogenation of benzene would be three times that of cyclohexene, right? Because there's three double bonds and a six-member ring. But in fact, what you're going to find is that, in fact, the, the enthalpy of hydrogenation for benzene uh, is different than what you would expect for three equivalents of cyclohexene. All right, I won't tell you which direction it goes. It's either going to be more endothermic or more exothermic. Um, you, can probably, you can argue physically which one it should be. And so you're going to have a difference in energy, right? So it asks you to calculate the energy or the enthalpy per double bond. And you're going to find that the benzene per enthalpy per double bond is either less or greater than the for cyclohexene. And that difference is the stabilization energy due to aromaticity. Okay, that there's this small deep, that the double bonds in benzene aren't really double bonds in the sense of a cyclohexene double bond. Right, so there's going to be some energetic difference in some direction. I won't tell you which direction it is, that's kind of the point, but it should be pretty clear by the numbers which way it goes. It should either be more exothermic or more endothermic as a function of per double bond. Cyclobutadiene is the exact opposite. Okay, you should expect, you should see the opposite effect in enthalpy for cyclobutadiene using that same analysis. Um, and that's due to, and the idea is, is that, that partially that destabilization in cyclobutadiene is due to the anti-aromaticity of that molecule. But in fact, cyclobutadiene has an additional energetic factor, which is the ring strain. Carbons, don't, carbons like to be in six-member rings because that gets their bond angles just right. But in a four-member ring, they're quite strained. So when you hydrogenate cyclobutadiene, you're removing the anti-aromaticity destabilization, as well as some of the ring strain. So the last couple problems on problem one are about decoupling those two effects, right? This ring strain takes is, adds some destabilization on, on its own, and anti-aromaticity does as well, and the total difference of enthalpy of hydrogenation is a sum of those two. So the, the last couple questions is asking you to subtract out the ring strain and see how much is left due to anti-aromaticity. And then last question is to ask on absolute magnitude. If, if, is aromaticity a bigger stabilizer in absolute magnitude than anti-aromaticity is a destabilizer in absolute magnitude of the energy? Okay, and you should find that they're very different. You should find that aromaticity, I won't tell you which way it goes, but one of them is a bigger effect than the other. Right. And you should be able to just pull that out just from the numbers. The only numbers you need from ATCT or NIST are just the enthalpies of formation. Everything else can be done. It's just subtracting energies from all the calculations that you do in the problem. Uh, any questions about problem two? Okay. Wait, have... Yeah, sure. When you say plug in the hint, um, plug in the ideal gas law yeah. for beta. Yeah. Side to make it equal to either of the equation? No, I would just, you have, you have a, in beta, you have a partial derivative in the formula for beta, and for an ideal gas, you should just plug it in and see what happens. Plug it into the partial derivative. Okay. And, and the math should fall out. And then for, and then for 2.2, I'll just remind you, a couple people asked me about the hint for 2.2 to integrate both sides. You're going to take the original formula for beta this 1 over V dV dP, and separate the variables so you have volume on one side and pressure on the other, and then integrate both sides. Right. 
Because you can see in the, in the resulting formula, you have volume on one side and pressure on the other side. So you just need to manipulate the formula for beta to get it into that pressure on one side, volume on the other side, and then you integrate to get rid of the deeds, the der derivatives, or the differentials, rather. And then the, the pro, then 2.4, 2.5, and 2.6, or sorry, sorry, excuse me, 2.5, 2.6, 2.7, the extra credit is just deriving the formula you plug and chug in 2.3. Yeah, it was it was not supposed to be easy. Um, again, when it comes to partial credit on extra credit, I won't be as you could try it, and, I'll, and I might give you some points for attempting it. I won't be as as uh, 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 accommodating with my partial credit as I am with other things in this class uh, for the extra credit. But usually, if you give me a, a, an honest attempt, you'll at least get some points. Okay. Cool. So I'm very happy so far. Um, I'm glad we've, I've moved this class to two exams instead of three. I think that's a, probably a little more helpful. So we'll, um, so homework, so the exams due at the beginning of class on Thursday. And then um, I will publish a new homework set Thursday night, I think. And that'll be due for like, it'll be like two weeks. And it'll be pretty short. It'll be on phases and mixtures. And it'll be pretty straightforward. I think it'll be a two-week problem set. Uh, we, may, we may not have enough time for six problem sets. It may be a five problem set course. I haven't decided that yet. We'll see how things go. How many problem sets did you have last year? Six. But I planned on having seven or eight, I think I had. Like yeah, that. so I've, I've kept cutting it back. Mm -hmm. um, but we've slowed down because of that problem set three took us a really long time to submit, right? I, because of fall break, and I gave you guys some extra time. Um, so we're just a little behind on problem sets, but um, I don't think anyone's going to complain about that. Besides me. Okay. Yeah, so um, I want to come back to phase diagrams. Um, we're just going to talk, I'm going to talk briefly about pure component phase diagrams. Run molecule, okay? We're not looking at mixtures yet. Um, and so I just want to talk a little, I have one more equation I want to talk about that um, we, we, I asked kind of a generic question uh, at the beginning of last class, which was how do we draw these curves, right? These phase boundaries, right? And, and the question really comes down to what we want to calculate is given a point in PT space, what is the slope of the boundary dp dt, right? If we know, if we can calculate the slope of a curve at any point, we can integrate it and calculate the curve as a function of pressure and temperature. Right, so if we can come up with an equation that allows us to describe the change, the dpdt for a phase boundary, we can derive any phase boundary we want for any species. So it turns out there's a really nice equation for it, and it's really simple to derive. Um, so the, the, the things that we need to know about, about phase transitions, just as a reminder, and the big one, If phase A has Gibbs energy GA and phase B has free energy GB, then a phase transition occurs at some temperature and pressure such that the Gibbs energies are equal, right? that they're equal to each other. Or you could write, or delta G is equal to zero. Right. We'll, we'll, we'll formalize this concept once we get the mixtures. Um, but I think this is an easy enough way to think about it for a pure component, or for a pure, speed, pure molecule, pure material, that delta G is equal to zero. And right, we, can, we can also write this as delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S, which is equal to zero, which means that delta H is equal to T delta S. All right, we'll hold on to that for a minute. We'll come, in, come into use in order to drive it. So we have a really nice constraint uh, energetically for when phase transitions occur, right? G is zero, right? They're at equilibrium. It's equally likely to fall onto either side, right? It's equally spontaneous for a one phase, phase A to go to phase B, and phase B to go to phase A, right? That's a phase transition. There are many other definitions, but this is the thermodynamic one. So what we can also say 
I do have a better pen than this one. My my ex my markers this year are just not as good as my ones last year. Falling apart. <laughs> One thing we could say is that, oh wow, that one's totally screwed. We can also say that a phase transition is reversible. So we can write that the infinitesimal change in Gibbs in A is the same as it is in B. And we, and we actually have a really nice expression for the, the change in, in Gibbs. Let's recall, we talked about this last class, that the derivative with respect to temperature at constant pressure for Gibbs is equal to minus the entropy. And that Gibbs with respect to pressure at constant temperature is volume. Right? And these are only two variables, T and P. Right? We're only caring about T and P right now. Right, and so we know how, how G changes as a function of the two variables, pressure and temperature, which are our inputs, if you will. And so if you just do a little bit of algebra with this knowledge, you can write that the change in Gibbs is equal to V dP minus S dT. All right, this is the same as writing dG is equal to dG dP dP minus dG dt, constant pressure dt. All right, like that. All right, this is the total derivative. Sorry, plus. Sorry, this needs to be a plus, right? We just take the total derivative with respect to t and p, and we know that we can just plug in the partials. All right, so this is nice. That, that, that Gibbs energy is only really dependent on the molar volume of, of the species, in this case, in the entropy. So if, so if, DGA, the Gibbs of, of A is equal to the Gibbs of B, then we can write uh, the volume of A, the molar volume of ADP minus the entropy of A dt is equal to the volume of B dp minus the entropy of B dt. All right, and we can rearrange this equation, put the volumes on one side and the temperature components on the other side, right, which is VA minus VBDT, or BDDP, excuse me, is equal to the, ch the difference in entropy DT. Right, and notice that we already, we basically already have the uh, a start of this equation, right? If we derive, if we just do some algebra, we can get DP, DT in terms of these variables, which is that DP, DT is equal to the change in entropy divided by the change in volume, molar volume. Okay, this is not particularly helpful though, right? Because now we got in order to measure these curves, we need to measure the entropy change, and we also need to measure the volume change, right? So we might want to simplify this equation a little bit because this is kind of hard to do experimentally. We can do it, um, but it's a little tricky. So what, we can make some assumptions. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and erase this for now. So the assumption we can make is, let's assume isobaric conditions, right, which is the assumption we make for enthalpy anyway, that pressure doesn't change. And in those situations, we know that delta S is equal to the change in heat, total change in heat divided by temperature, which is just the change in enthalpy divided by temperature, right? And we, and we saw that, right? This is the same as saying the Gibbs is equal to zero, and you can show if Gibbs is equal to zero, then delta S is H equal to delta H over T. Right? It's just circular logic here, but the entropy is just related to the enthalpy at constant pressure divided by temperature when delta G is zero. Okay, so we can substitute that right in here, right? So now we don't have to worry about entropy. We can measure enthalpy instead. So therefore, I'll write this in a different color since I'm going to use this. That dp dt is equal to delta H over T, delta V bar. Right? 
This equation is called the Clausius equation, or is it? Or is it the Clapeyron equation? Yeah, sorry, wrong, wrong white guy. This is the Clapeyron equation. All right, and it says that the, the slopes of these have to do with the enthalpy change across the barrier divided by how the density changes, right? And this is probably a reasonable thing to think, is that you're going to have some, you're going to, your process of changing transition, or changing, excuse me, changing phases is going to have some enthalpy change. And there's also some PV work being done, right? If you go from a gas to a liquid, you're going to change the, the molar volume, which is one over the density effectively, quite a bit, right? You go from a very not dense gas to a more dense liquid. So this value is going to change a lot. So that's really nice. So that, this, this allows us to calculate pretty much anything we want about this, about this. If we can measure the enthalpy change across a phase transition, and we can do some basic density calculations, we can, we can calculate the slopes of these curves. Right? And so this actually is very helpful. So let's, for instance, let's go back to our traditional phase diagram and just do a little bit of analysis. So let's first look at the solid-liquid boundary. And let's let dpdt, just to keep things consistent, is equal to the enthalpy of melting, which is going to be divided by temperature times the change in volume. I'm just going to write it as the volume of the liquid minus the volume of the solid. Solids are right. We're products minus reactants, right? So we have this sign here, right? And we know, so we can already predict the signs of this very quickly because we know that delta H of melting, we're going from a highly, a, an ordered substance to a disordered substance, which means delta S is greater than zero, which means delta H is greater than zero, right? Because delta S is equal to delta H over T. Right? So if the sign of the entropy change is the sign of the same as the enthalpy change. So this, the numerator is greater than zero. And then let's look at the volume, right? The density or the molar volume, right? Remember that the units of molar volume are liters per mole. It's how many liters at a given pressure and temperature that one mole fills. So again, a liquid, a sol we can look, think of it in densities too, which are just the inverse. But the liquid's going to fill, a mole of liquid's going to fill more volume than a mole of solid, right? Because it's less, because liquid's less dense than a solid. The molar volume is larger, so this difference is positive. So for most substances, the slope between the solid and liquid boundary is going to be greater than zero for most substances. Right? Because the, 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 the solid is more right. The solid is more dense than the liquid. There's an exception, a very very big exception to this. And again, it's just on a molecule by molecule basis. Does anyone know a material, a chemical that has a less dense solid than the liquid phase? Or which one? The one form. Water. Yeah, water. So for water, the density of ice is less than the density of water or liquid, right? Which means that the molar volume of ice is greater than the molar volume of the liquid. So for H2O, dpdt of melting is less than zero. Right, so the way that I draw this is slightly positive, but in fact, in, 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 li in water, it goes like this instead. Right, and that's only because the liquid phase is more dense than the ice phase. So the boundary goes this way instead of this way. Right, but for liquid and gas, for instance, going from liquid to gas, this is always going to have a positive slope, right? Because the liquid's almost basically never more dense than the gas up to the critical point, right? The critical point, they're exactly the same, and then it breaks down, right? So I'll write that down real quick. So for gas, 
or sorry, let's say for liquid to gas transition, the density of the liquid is always much greater than the gas up to the critical point where they're equal. So dp dt for a liquid to gas is always greater than zero. Right, which is why I always grow it with this nice curve here. Right. This is why it's always positive and monotonic. Right? But eventually it hits the critical point where the densities are exactly the same, and there's no <coughs> difference between liquid and gas there. Right? So this line eventually ends at the critical point, and there's no phase boundary past it. However, there's no critical point between liquid and solid, so this line continues basically for infinity. Not really infinity, but it just keeps going. Because there's no critical point between solid and liquid. It's just liquid and gas. So in general, the liquid gas, or basically the gas versus condensed phase boundary here, always looks the same for every species. It's the solid and liquid one that can be kind of weird because the, 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 vol the molar volumes may switch depending on the material. Question? So if the... Um Substance is less dense in ice form, then it's going to be larger in the bar form? Correct. Right. So if the density is lower, that means you need more volume per gram of material. So that means the molar volume will be larger. So we can always write. So let's let's just do the let's just do this, let's just do the, di the, the, the dimensional analysis. So rho is, is mass over volume. And, and uh, volume, molar volume is, is volume over moles. Right, so in order to convert between them, you take rho is going to be equal to the inverse of the molar volume. That gives me moles per volume. <coughs> and then we need to convert moles to grams to mass. So you're going to multiply by grams per mole, m, which is the molar mass, which is gram mass per mole. So the density of a material is equal to its molar volume inverse times its molar mass. That'll give you mass per volume, right? So they're inversely related to each other. You can rewrite the Clapeyron equation in terms of 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 molar volume of densities, which may be much easier by writing, I'll just write it over here, dp dt is equal to delta h uh, tm1 over density a minus 1 over density with b, something like that. That would be equal. So however you want to think about it. But in general, they're just inversely related to each other. So molar volume goes up, density goes down. So we can, we can kind of come up with some more qualitative uh, assumptions about this too, which is thinking about the slope of the solid liquid line is ten, tends to be invariant to temperature, right? As we increase the pressure, this doesn't really change in temperature, right? It's pretty much straight up. And that shouldn't be that surprising because the, the, the molar volume difference between a liquid and solid um, is, much, is quite small. Right? They're not that much different. Right? The difference between ice, the density of ice and density of liquid water room temperature is not that great. It's about 10 or 20%. Right? So you have a small number in the, numer in the denominator, so the slope is high. Not only that, it doesn't really, it, it's pretty much a straight line because the molar volume doesn't have a lot of temperature dependence. Right? The, if you, as you heat a solid, its, its density doesn't really change that much. Same with the liquid. So, so these molar volumes are not dependent on temperature so much, weakly dependent on temperature. So this difference is effectively fixed and it's small, so the slope is going to be quite high. Are quite large because the because this denominator doesn't change very much. Okay. However, and we'll come to this in just a second. 
Of course, the molar volume of a gas changes a lot with temperature, right? It has to by the ideal gas law. Right? Its volume is inversely proportional to temperature, sorry, linearly proportional to temperature, a constant pressure. So as you, as you increase temperature, the molar volume of the gas is going to change a lot. So the denominator changes by quite a bit as you increase pressure and temperature. And so you end up having a nonlinear curve for the gas boundary. Right, because the gas molar volume is, a, is quite dependent on the, on the, on the conditions. Right? It's dependent on temperature and pressure. So that's why you get this kind of curve that has a, has a, weak, a weak slope. In fact, it, it should never be negative. It should always be positive like that. It has a weak slope. And then as temperature increases, the volume difference between a, the gas and the condensed phase changes a lot because the gas density drops as you increase temperature. And so you end up getting a curve instead, right? Because this has a this volume term has a temperature dependence to it, and I can show that to you in a really straightforward fashion. Well, there's another way to write the, this equation, Clapeyron equation, for gas and condensed. So if we look at a transition between gas and the condensed phase, either liquid or solid, mostly solid liquid, but solid. You can say you can make the assumption that the volume of the gas is much larger than the volume of the condensed phase. And not only can you do that, you can assume ideality. So the volume of the gas is RT over P, right? That's just the, sorry, that's just the ideal gas law, right? So we can substitute that into the Clapeyron equation. And when you do that, you end up getting dP dt is equal to the applied pressure times the enthalpy of vaporization times RT t squared. So this is for this is called the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Right, and so if, when you're dealing with gases or volatile liquids, this is your go-to place, right? We can learn so much about the, the, the vapor conditions of a material by, by applying the Clausius Clapeyron equation to that, that phase boundary. And I'll and I'll show that to you. We can do better. We can do one better than this equation. If you note just to use it as a math trick, that the derivative of the log of pressure, or the derivative of any variable with respect to, a, to t, is equal to the, that very, one over that variable times the derivative of that variable with respect to t. Right? So I'm just making a substitution here. I can now bring in this one factor of one, if I express this in terms of the derivative of the logarithm of the pressure, I can get rid of this p factor inside of the Clapeyron equation which leads to that the derivative of the logarithm of p is equal to just the enthalpy divided by rt squared. Okay. Now even better is, is now I have a really easy differential equation or differential equation I can integrate. If I multiply both sides by dt, <coughs> I can so then I can, and then integrate both sides from t1 to t2, or sorry, sorry, excuse me, we're integrating p, p1 to tp2, and t2 to t1. This ends up being the integral from p1 to p2 of the derivative of log of p equals the integral from t1 to t2 of delta h over rt squared dt. And we can make a really nice assumption here. So let me rewrite that real quick in bigger words. So we have the derivative from p1 to p2 of d lin p, which is equal to Let's make, an, let's make some assumptions here. 
R is a constant, and let's assume delta H is a constant as well as a function of temperature. We can bring those out of the integral, and we get the integral from T1 to T2 of dt over t squared. Right. Now this is a really straightforward integral to calculate. On the left hand side you get the ln of p2 minus the ln of p1. And on the other side you get delta h over r times 1 over t1 minus 1 over t2. And I'll just rewrite that in the classic way which is the log of p2 over p1 is equal to delta H over R, 1 minus T1 minus 1 over T2. So this is the integrated clausius coplerion equation. And you can learn so much about vapor this way. Let me give you an example. Right, if we know, for instance, if we know the vapor pressure of a material at a given temperature, we can calculate the vapor pressure of that material at any temperature we want. So for instance, we go ahead and erase over here. Let's consider water for a second. At one bar, so at P, equals one bar, water boils at two, uh, sorry, 373.15 Kelvin. So what does it boil at? At, let's say, um, Let's do, let's do a fun pressure. What's the pressure of Mars, atmospheric pressure of Mars? So Mars's atmospheric pressure is, um, I'll get to you in bar in just a second, 0 0.05 divided by 14.7. 0 0.0, sorry, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 0 0.0, 46 bar. All right, so that's the pressure of atmosphere at, at on Mars, right? And we have everything we need, well, other than the enthalpy, right? If we know the enthalpy of vaporization, how much enthalpy is released when you take liquid water and boil it, we can calculate the pressure, or sorry, the temperature at which it boils on Mars. So the enthalpy of vaporization for water so delta H back for water is equal to 43.9 kilojoules per mole. Okay, so now all we have to do is plug in. So we have the log of one bar. All right, let's do that. Actually, let's let P2 be Mars. So 0 0.00646 bar divided by one bar equals 43.9 I'm going to write 43,900 joules per mole divided by R, which is 8.3145 joules per Kelvin per mole. Times 1 over, and again, T1 here is going to be room temperature, or sorry, boiling at room temperature, or down Earth, minus 1 over T2. Right? Now we have everything we need. Right? The nice thing is, is that we're taking ratios here, so we don't even have to worry about what units are pressure in as long as they're consistent because they cancel out. Right? And we just have to make sure R is in the right units for our energy and that the units of our temperature match R. Right? So Kelvin's always a good, a good number for that. Right? So all we need to do here is solve for T2, which I'm just going to do with Wolfram Alpha. So we're going to take the log of 0 0.0646 divided by 1 equals 43,900 divided by 8.3145 times 1 over 373.15 minus 1 over x. And what you find here is that T2 is equal to 
275 Kelvin. So this is super useful. For instance, we use in gas in gas phase science we use this equation almost implicitly. A great example is when we do gas phase spectroscopy, when we want to study a molecule in the gas phase, um, we don't all often introduce the molecule in its pure form. So we don't just take a vapor <coughs> of water. If we want to study water, we don't just throw water vapor into our chamber. There are various reasons why that is. Um, but typically what we do is we want to form it into a dilute mixture. Right? We want to think of it in liquid form we don't tend to, when we want to study the properties of a material, we don't always look at it in a pure form. Sometimes we solvate it, right? We make a dilute solution of our material. And so we do that in gas phase spectroscopy all the time. We take a vapor of a molecule and we mix that vapor with our gas phase solvent, if you will, which is typically a, a carrier gas like helium or argon, neon, something inert, right? And we have a mixture of our helium and say our molecules, say water, um, and in order to get the right conditions, we need to make sure that we have the proper concentration, if you will. And so, for instance, the, the vapor, the water pressure, sorry, the vapor pressure of water at room temperature is about 40 torr. It's not that high. Um, and, and so, if you're doing things with water where you need high concentration, it can be really difficult to generate tanks of water, of dilute water vapor in a mixture with helium or neon because you just don't get enough vapor out of the material, right? So if your vapor pressure from your water sample is 40 torr, that's all you're ever going to get out of the system. Right? You can't get more than 40 torr out. And so sometimes we need to do something special, right? Maybe we need 100 torr of water, right? And all we have to do is just plug in the Clapeyron equation and calculate the temperature we need to heat our water sample up to get 100 torr out. And so it's a really useful equation for, for gas phase. Um, and you know you can do fun things with this equation. You know like if you're if you want to calculate the boiling point of water um, in Denver as compared to New Haven, you can do it with this, right? You can measure the atmospheric pressure in Denver, and you can see how the temperature of boiling suppresses as you increase the pressure or decrease the atmospheric pressure. All right, in general, in general, because of the way that this equation works, because the enthalpy of vaporization is positive, the lower you make the pressure, I'm going to write this down because it's a really nice um, thing to mention. And this is in general. An observation. Uh, in general, the boiling point of a liquid decreases as pressure decreases. And there's a couple ways to look at this. One, one is, is, of course, you can just look at this equation and say if this ratio is getting smaller, or more negative, right? This is a this logarithm is negative because this ratio is less than one. And so a logarithm of a number less than one is negative. That T2 has to go down accordingly. The boiling temperature has to go down. But another way to say it is that boiling occurs when the vapor pressure of a material is equal to the vapor pressure of the atmosphere or the, or the surroundings. Right, so as you lower the vapor pressure, or you lower the atmospheric pressure, then the vapor pressure for boiling also goes down. Right? So that means the temperature will be lower. And that's all enforced by the fact that the enthalpy is greater than zero for vaporization. If vaporization were an exothermic property, it would be the opposite case. That would mean that the boiling point, if the vaporization enthalpy were negative, then that means that the lower the pressure, the higher the boiling point will become. The sign changes. Right? And of course, that's nonsensical right? because of this assumption right here. So, so and that's another proof that, again, when you go from an ordered, ordered phase or disordered phase, that the enthalpy is always going to be positive. 
because the entropy increases, therefore the enthalpy increases. And that, that allows us to encode all of this information about boiling points and vapor pressures. Right? This is why we rotovap things right, to get rid of solvents as we evacuate the material, we evacuate your, your flask with, uh, of the pressure so that your volatile components will boil more readily at room temperature because the pressure is lower inside the flask. Right? So that increases, that drops the boiling temperature, which increases the flow of your volatiles out of your, of your flask. Right? It's the entire point of rotovapping. Right? Rotovapping is just the Clausius Clapeyron equation done with an instrument. Questions about this? Yes? Is this the premise that like pressure cookers are based off of? Um, well, so pressure cookers are a different situation because in pressure cookers you're at constant volume. Um, but yes, that's also true. At constant volume, yeah, your, your boiling point of your water will increase because as you start to heat it, the pressure will increase internally at constant volume. So the boiling point of the water also increases. Yeah, I guess that's fair. So you have to be careful with the, the thermodynamics there because you're in a different limiting case. Uh, but that's, that's the correct idea. If you're a constant volume, as you increase temperature, the pressure increases, which means that the boiling point increases as well. Yeah, right, which is why you don't ever want to use a boiling, why when you use a pressure cooker, the last thing you want to do is pop it open and, and stick your head there because you've got superheated water vapor, right? The moment you release that pressure in a, in a hot, you know, in a, vapor, a pressure cooker that might be cooking at, you know, 250 degrees or 300 degrees, you're going to open that, and all of that pressure gets equalized. All of that vapor pressure that was liquid, all that hot water is going to instantly vaporize and blast you of steam at 400 degrees, because that's what temperature it's at. No, it will. It would also explode. Yes, it would also explode. That's right. It, yes, that's right. Toasted. Seems like you guys have learned this one the hard way. <laughs> I was making cocoa, and I, I didn't let it naturally unpressurize. I yeah. did the little thing on top, and hot cocoa just went everywhere. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, and of course you can, you can use this equation very easily if you can measure the temperature inside, and you can probably calculate the pressure is as well, using the Clausius Clapeyron. Of course, the, the, the assumption we're making here is that enthalpy is not changing with temperature, right? which is not a good assumption. Um, but for, for regions close to the same temperature, you get a good approximation. So in fact, this number is probably Right? The, the difference between the enthalpy of vaporization at 275 versus 373 is probably somewhat significant. So this is just an approximation. But it gets you to the right, it gives you the right, the right qualitative answer, if you will. So in, in general, if you go into, for instance, in this web book, in this web book for, for common vapor uh, volatile <coughs> molecules, has a list of vapor pressures as a function of temperature. And what they do is they take this equation here and then assume that the enthalpy, again, remember the enthalpy at a given temperature is equal to the standard enthalpy plus the integral of the heat capacity, the temperature across those temperatures. Right, so they, they express this, uh, they express this enthalpy where this is a polynomial, this is going to be AX to the fourth plus B. A T to the fourth, B T to the third, plus C T to the squared, plus D T plus E. All right, it's going to be some polynomial. All right, so your your enthalpy is a fun, is a polynomial in T, and you could plug this into A, delta H here, and then do some algebra, and you get a nice polynomial equation for the vapor pressure with respect to temperature. Right, so you can use the heat capacity to correct for that very easily. All right, so that's what that's what this does. This does all that work for us, uh, but all they're doing is just approximating the enthalpy change as a polynomial as a function of temperature and just doing algebraic substitution into this equation. So it's easy to correct for, for, for these, in, these inadequacies, these assumptions. Okay, any other questions about this? Okay, so, um, right, so this kind of, I, I want to kind of stop with, with pure phase diagrams for now. I, that's kind of all we need to know. Um, instead, what I want to talk about for the next two days, uh, finishing up, is, is looking at mixtures, right, where we have more than one component. Right? And in fact, we're going to be sticking to this idea of having multiple components for quite a while, because when we're in equilibrium, right, when we're doing equilibrium, we're going to be looking at a mixture of your products and your reactants, and we need to consider the thermodynamics of both simultaneously. 
right? The different phases of them, how the thermodynamics of one changes with respect to the other, how do they mix? We haven't even shown that molecules spontaneously mix together. Uh, we implicitly know that if you take two liquids that are miscible, they just mix spontaneously, but we don't have any verification of that yet. We haven't even proved that. All right, so we're gonna tackle that problem now. And then once we get an understanding of how things mix, we'll look at liquids, we'll look at solids, we'll look at gases first, of course. We'll be able to talk about the phase diagrams of multiple components, which will lead us right into, or right into equilibrium as well. Okay, the math that we learn about multiple component mixtures will, will, will be directly applicable to equilibrium. Okay. How much time do I have today? Let's see where I want to tackle this. Okay, great. Yeah. So what I want to do today is answer a very simple question. Let's say, for instance, I have a box. We're back to our box of gas. It took me a long time to learn how to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to partition this box into two plots. Uh, let's see. So I'm going to partition this box into two separate components, all right? And let me make sure I have all my variables right. All right, so let's say, for instance, on the left side, we have, this is at some temperature and pressure, and that we have some molecule A, we have Na moles of component A. Okay. And then on the other side, we're going to do the same thing. I'm going to say it's at the same temperature and pressure, just for simplicity, but I have Nb moles of component B. Okay, so we have the same conditions but we have two different gases in each of the sides. And the question I'm, I'm gonna ask is if I remove the partition, what happens? All right, so far we've only talked, so for instance in homework, homework three when we did the, we kinda did this with entropy. We did it the opposite way we did with the entropy question where we had one box and we put the box we split the box and we know that it splits evenly. It's so now I'm doing the opposite thing. But the, the, thing, the important thing is that in that entropy problem, we assume that the material in the, in the box is exactly the same. Right? We just have n particles of the same thing. But here now we have two different components with two different amounts of moles. Right? So the question is now, how does this influence the effects of when I open this? Right? Do, do they mix? And the question is, is do they mix? If we open them, if we open the box up, do A and B mix? Okay, and so in order to answer this question, we actually have to, we, we really haven't discussed the thermodynamics of moles, of components moving back and forth. Right, we've assumed every particle in these boxes are exactly the same, but now we have to handle the math of B moles maybe moving this way and A moles moving this way. Right, so we have to distinguish those. So there's a couple of really nice equations that we can use to, to tackle that. And the one that I want to introduce to you today is one that's very somewhat painful to work with, but it's a quite useful kind of qualitative tool. And it's this idea of a chemical potential. And it's really hard to explain what a chemical potential is other than by its definition. All right, so we define the chemical potential. I may not use it because that might be a critical point. Kim pot of a component I. by mu sub i, 
In fact, I'm going to put the I in the superscript form, you, you super I, where the chemical potential of component I is the derivative of the Gibbs energy of that component with respect to the change in its moles, holding everything constant. So pressure, holding temperature pressure constant, as well as the moles of every component that isn't this component, the J not equal to I. Okay? You can think of this in terms of constant, maybe it's useful to think about this as the energetic form of a concentration gradient. Imagine that we have, we open this box, just kind of intuitively, we have the chemical potential of our components A in here. They exhibit some chemical potential A. And, and we may also have the chemical potential of B in here and the chemical potential of A here. All right, and when we open this box initially, so let's call this, let me change this notation a little bit. So let's call this box two. This is component B, component A. This is box one, component A and component B. So the chemical potential is separated. We can measure the potential on this side and the potential on this side for each component. Right, so initially, again, there's, there's no, initially, the number of moles of A in box B is zero. So, it, so mu, let me write this again, box two component A is equal to component box one for component B, which is equal to zero, right? There are no molecules, right? There are no A <laughs> molecules in two, box two, side two, and there's no molecules of B in box one, right? And then we can also say that the opposite ones, right? Component A in box one and component B in box two are maximum, are maximum. We don't know what their values are. It's not important right now. We can talk about that later how we calculate them, but you, they're large numbers. Right? And what we're going to do is we're going to lift the box. The principle is of chemical potential is that the, chemi is that the, the component for a given component is minimized. Okay, so the idea is, if we lift this box, this is going to be, this is zero, this is large, this is zero, and this is large. A and, a and B, components A and B, when we open this box and all things to move, there's going to be a concentration gradient, right? There's going to be a lot of A here, no A here, and vice versa. And so what's, what A wants to do is to move so that the total chemical potential over the whole box is as low as possible, right? So what's going to happen is, is that species that have high chemical potential in one region are going to want to move to a region of low chemical potential. So molecules with large A, large U, will want to move to minimize their value of, of, of A, or of mu, of the potential. Right, you can think of this in the same way as any other potential energy, right? If we, gravitational potential energy is a great example. You put a mole, you put a, you have your mass, here you have this up here, right? This, this has some gravitational potential energy, right? Which is the height of the, of the drop times times the, the mass times of the, of the marker times the, the acceleration due to gravity, right? So there's high chemical potential, there's high gravitational potential energy in this molecule, in the, or sorry, in this, this marker, and when I let it go, it's going to want to lower that potential energy as much as possible, which means it's going to drop, right? And so chemical potential works the same way. It's the idea of how much potential motion there is in a component to do something. Right? It could be a chemical conversion. Right? You can think about this in terms of reactions. Maybe A wants to go to B. So you can monitor the potential. If the, if the molecule A really wants to react to form B, then the potential of A initially is very high, and it's going to move to lower that, which means it's going to move forward in the reaction. 
And the same idea here, if you have a concentration gradient, the chemical potential flow from, that wants to go from high to low over time implies that if you have a concentration gradient that the system over time is going to equilibrate and move concentration from one end of high concentration to the area that has low concentration. Right? You, have a co you can think of chemical potential in some ways as a concentration gradient or representing a concentration gradient. And of course, concentration gradient, this is just the energetic version of it, right? We're looking at Gibbs free energy with respect to the change in the moles, right? And concentration gradient will be the concentration as a function of distance. Right? If you think about molecules starting here and ending here, then that, the, the gradient of concentration is going to be, say, the change in moles with respect to the change in, in position in the box. Okay, so this is kind of an odd, an odd concept. It's kind of hard to visualize, but as we move through mixture, as we move through equilibrium, it will become a very natural way to track things. But basically, you can think that molecules that exhibit a concentration gradient have some energetic impedit, impetus to minimize that gradient, right? They're going to want to flow from a, a region of high concentration to low concentration. Or if you have product, reactants that want to move to products, then they're going to have an impetus to change from products to or reactants to products. Right? You can express that as a potential energy, which is the chemical potential. Um, right, so let's see where we're at. Right, so now what, what I want to do is I want to open the box. Right, and I want to see how things flow. And we can write a couple of nice things down, for instance, that the Gibbs, well, this, this pen's gone. Some nice equations. That the Gibbs of a species can be equal to the Gibbs at standard conditions, plus the logarithm of the pressure divided by the pressure at standard conditions. All right, so if we assume standard conditions T equals 298.15 and P equals 1 bar. Right? And, and because Gibbs and, and, and you, as, it's easy to find out that Gibbs and, and, and mu work in the same way, the chemical potential of a species <coughs> is equal to the standard state chemical potential plus the logarithm. I'm oh, sorry, I forgot one more factor here. It needs to be in terms of energy, RT. RT when P over P naught. You can always just typically write P naught as one bar, so it makes the math a lot easier. Right, so what we can do now is now define the Gibbs free energy of mixing. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna lift this box up and we're gonna ask the question, what, what, is, the Gib, what is the free energy of, of mixing these, right? To let A diffuse over here and B diffuse over here. Okay, and that's so G mix is gonna be equal to the moles of A times RP times the partial pressure of A divided by the total pressure plus NB RT lin uh, PB over P. All right, this is the same as writing delta G mix is equal to G A plus G B. Na. This is the number of moles okay. of A times RT. Times number of moles of B times RT. So it doesn't mean Avogadro's number. No, it means okay. moles. Yeah, not big N, but little N. Yeah, Na moles. Na moles. It's the same ones as in the figure. So this isn't particularly. This is useful for gases, but we can express things a little more easily by introducing a new idea. Maybe you've seen this before. 
the idea, the definition of what's called a mole fraction. We can define the mole fraction of a component, x sub i, as the number of moles of that component divided by the total number of moles in the mixture. And you can show that the sum of all the mole partial or molar fractions of all your components all equal one. Okay, so this is kind of like a, a relative concentration, if you will. Right? It just tells you if you have one mole total, right? If Na plus Nb is one, x sub i tells you what fraction of the moles um, is component one. Component A in this case. Right? And so we can also write in terms of pressures that the partial pressure P sub J is equal to the mole fraction of component J times the total pressure. All right, so we can interconvert between partial pressures, right, and we can write P1 plus P2 plus all the way to P sub N is equal to the total pressure. All right, so we're just, we're just subdividing our total number of moles into fractions, right? And all those fractions sum up to the total. All right, so we can take this expression, we can express these partial pressures in terms of these mole fractions, right, which makes us a little more general. We don't have to define a specific pressure. We can just measure things in terms of mole fraction. So that means, therefore, delta G mix is equal to the number of total moles times RT times the mole fraction of A times the logarithm of fraction A plus XB log XB. All, right, all we've done is take this definition of, of, of moles, of mole fraction, substitute it in here for the Na and Nb, and also for the partial pressures, right? So we've substituted our mole fraction definition for the partial pressures and the partial mole counts as well. So everything is relative to the total number of moles. And we can express our <coughs> contra independent contributions just in terms of their, part, their, their mole fractions. And this is really nice because but we can just do some very basic analysis, is that the mole fractions sum up to 1, which means that all the mole fractions are less than 1. So for all i, x of i is less than 1. So let's look at this value. This is a positive number. This is a positive number. This is negative, right? Because ln of a number, logarithm of a number less than 1 is negative. And this is a positive number. This is a positive number. This is a negative number. So what you have overall is a positive times a negative, which means that delta G mix is less than 0 for any, any gas mixture. So that means that mixing ideal gases is always Spontaneous. Okay, there's no such thing of inadmissible gases. All right, you can't just take two gases and it forms a, a, a two layers, if you will, like you can with liquids, right? Oil and water, right? That does not happen with with gases. Gases, by and large, I can't. I, I guess I can think of some. Ex there might not be any exceptions uh, because the corrections from ideality are small, but in normal conditions, every gas will mix with every gas spontaneously and will mix perfectly. Even more interestingly, right, we can show this, and this is probably not that surprising, is recall that the derivative of Gibbs with respect to temperature at constant pressure is minus the entropy. Right, so we can just take the derivative of this with respect to temperature. The T drops out. Right, that's all that happens. None of this is dependent on temperature. It's just a number. And it's minus. So if delta G, if delta G is minus, then that means delta S of mixing is always positive. Right? It's an entropically favored result.
Not only that, if you plug in the fact that this is greater than zero and this is going to be less than zero, by the, it's in, by the same amount, you can show that the enthalpy of mixing is equal to zero for ideal gases. Right, so, so mixing of gases is entirely entropically driven. No heat is exchanged. Right? The only thing that happens is you're taking a system that is disordered, that is ordered, right? We've put A in one, one box and B in the other box, and we've moved to a disordered phase or disordered situation where you have a mixture of A and B together. That's obviously entropically favorable. Right? Delta S is definitely increasing because you're making a bigger mess of the box. But even more is that it exchanges no heat. That the, the amount of Gibbs that you get out is equal and opposite to the amount of entropy. It's entirely entropically driven. This does change. Now, if you assume not ideality, the enthalpy may change because if you're, by moving molecules, imagine that A has very strong intermolecular interactions with each other, and you've, got, you've in, doubled the volume that A can exist in, and that the attractions between A and B, let me write this, let me write this down. So, Let's say that the attract that AA attractions are strong. And AB attractions are weak. So in mixing, you'll have to break some AA attractions as the concentration of A drops upon mixing, right? Because you've doubled the volume, right? So there's less AA close to each other. So when you mix A into the B box, You've doubled the volume. There's less A around A. There's going to be more Bs around A, right? which means that the, the net attractive forces are weaker in the mixture, which will mean that the enthalpy, the system will have to absorb some energy in order to break those AA bonds to mix properly. right? So there, when you do mix gases that are not ideal, depending on the situation, you might have an, an, a, an enthalpy change. Right? Because, because the, the new situation where A is kind of existing everywhere and it doesn't have a lot of, it, does, it has to inter intermingle with A and B together and it doesn't like intermingling with B, you're going to have a, a change in the state of those, of those interactions. You're going to have to break some in order to mix, which means you have to pump energy into the system. Right? So you have endothermic mixing. Right? So some, some gases that are very strongly bound, when you mix them, the whole, the whole chamber or the whole system cools off or sorry, heats up, sorry, heats up. Right, the system has to absorb some energy in order to mix them so the gas will heat slightly. Right? That, that happens especially with things like water and formic acid. Formic acid is a really great example of a gas uh, that where a very large majority, a very large fraction of the molecules exist as a dimer. And so when you have a pure gas vapor of, of formic acid, um, you have a lot of hydrogen bonds between the formic acid monomers, and then when you move to dilute it into, say, helium or neon to very low concentration, you have to break those double bonds in order to, those hydrogen bonds in order for them to mix. And so the system will heat up slightly because you have to break those, those, those bonds. Right? So the enthalpy will change. But again, in general, for ideal gases, there's no heat exchange. Right? So any, any heat exchange you measure is all non-ideal. Right? It's all real. It's all due to intermolecular attractions. Of course, the opposite case is that imagine if, if the AB attractions are really good, right, and A prefers to bind with B than it does with itself, then you might see H mix less than zero because as it mixes, you're forming more attractive interactions and the system releases energy that way. It's exothermic instead of endothermic. Right, so, so in general, it, you, it depends on the situation. Questions about this? Okay. All right. So that's that's really nice because what we can what we've shown now is is that things mix, right? They're going to mix. 
And anything that doesn't mix implies that some non-ideal behavior is occurring. Right? In general, if everything's perfect, perfectly ideal, everything's going to mix without any complaints. It's entropically favored. No heat is exchanged. It's just going to happen spontaneously at any temperature and any pressure. Right? And we're going to find that also for liquids. Right? We're going to make an assumption for liquids coming down, or solids, for, well, liquids in particular. We're going to make an assumption, well, if does this also work for liquids? Right? Does the, is the entropy greater than zero? And is the enthalpy small? And of course, that's not the case. Right? There are very obviously, there are liquids that don't mix at any temperature. There are liquids that mix at all temperatures. Um, and then there are liquids that mix at some and some and, and not at other temperatures. And so that must mean that the entropy changes signs depending on the temperature in liquids. Um, and so liquids are going to be a little more complicated because of that. But we'll, we'll, we'll tackle it from the same assumption, right? That, that liquids are ideal, if you will, which means that they mix spontaneously and they don't exchange energy or exchange heat. Um, and we'll look at how those fall apart, how those assumptions fall apart for liquids. But in general, for gases, this is always true. Any two gases that you have, you can mix them, and you'll get a nice, even mixture of them every single time you put them in. OK, once we get to that, once we start to understand the idea of component mixtures, we can come back to phases. right? We can start thinking about the phases of, of mixtures. right? And maybe we'll find up some really interesting behaviors. Um, and all of those behaviors are going to be due to real effects, non-ideality. Um, that's all I have for you today. So uh, exam due on Thursday. I have office hours tomorrow. If you guys have any last minute questions, you can always email me. And have a lovely day. Hi, Hi Taylor. What's up? Um, I have a question about sure. this. Um, I was wondering what is the like, difference, I 